What made a mild-mannered loner from small-town America turn into Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield, a grave robber, murderer, and ghoulish collector of female body parts, the inspiration for Norman Bates, Leatherface, and countless other horror film demons? I'm Professor Graham Yorston, forensic neuropsychiatrist, and today I'm exploring the life of Ed Gein to work out why he committed some of the most horrific crimes of the 20th century, and to reevaluate some of the more sensationalist claims about him. Edward Theodore Gein was born in Wisconsin in 1906. His father was an abusive alcoholic and his mother Augusta, a domineering and fanatically religious woman who controlled every aspect of Ed and his older brother Henry's lives. She looked down on other women, believing them all to be depraved and constantly warned her sons about their wickedness, hoping to deter any sexual stirrings they might have had. Mrs. Gein ran a grocery store in La Crosse and worked long hours to make enough money to move the family away from the immorality of the city to somewhere quieter. But even in Plainfield, a small town of a few hundred people, she did her best to keep her sons away from other people, allowing them out only to attend school. Ed was a shy and withdrawn squint-eyed child and his school teachers remembered him having strange mannerisms such as randomly bursting out laughing and the other children avoided him. Just as well really as his mother would scold him whenever he tried to make friends. Gein always tried to please his mother, believing her to be the ultimate paragon of virtue good in every way. She though found fault with everything he and Henry did, convinced they were going to become lazy good-for-nothings like the husband she despised. Gein grew up with his ears ringing from the rebukes of his mother and the fists of his father. When he was in his thirties his father died and he and his brother tried to earn some money by doing odd jobs and babysitting for neighbours. And they were considered honest and reliable enough even if Ed seemed a little strange. A few years later, tragedy. The brothers had set a fire to clear vegetation on the farm and it got out of control. They tackled it from different directions, but when the blaze was out, Henry was nowhere to be found. Ed phoned the police to help him search, but when they arrived, he led them straight to the body, which showed no signs of being burned, but did have bruising to the back of the head. No official investigation was conducted, and no autopsy performed. The coroner gave the cause of death as asphyxiation, but it has been speculated that his own brother may have been Gein's first murder victim. I initially had my doubts about this, as it would have been very different to his later crimes with no clear motive. But his brother was dating a divorced woman of two and was planning to move in with her. And crucially, he had begun to be openly critical of their mother and this may have been enough to turn Ed against him. Shortly after Henry's death, his mother had a dense stroke which left her paralysed and Gein had to devote himself to taking care of her. Following a second stroke a year later, her health deteriorated further and in December 1945 she died, leaving Gein alone in the world. He really had no idea how to cope without his mother. She had made all the decisions his whole life so he shut himself off in his squalid farmhouse and lived off whatever meagre earnings he could get. Later he complained that his neighbours took advantage of him with dirty deals as he called them, not paying rent on fields they had used and not helping him out when he needed it. In his solitude he took to reading, books about headhunters and cannibals in the South Seas, anatomy books and accounts of the barbaric experiments carried out by Nazi doctors in the war. He had a particular fascination with Ilse Koch, who had tattooed prisoners skinned. He kept his mother's bedroom as a shrine, locked and undisturbed, exactly how it was when she was alive. He even tried to bring her back to life, believing he had a special power to do so. When that didn't work, Gein started going to local cemeteries at night and digging up the bodies of women, taking them home to preserve as trophies and turning them to clothing and macabre furniture. He searched for recently buried middle-aged women who resembled his mother. He made face masks from their faces, leggings from their legs, bowls from their skulls, a drum from stretched skin, 
a lampshade and a set of four chairs. The list goes on and on. He kept the nine women in a shoebox. One he painted silver, others he tied up with ribbons. He made a belt, he made socks, a vest and an apron, all from the flesh of the bodies he'd dug up and preserved. He visited three local cemeteries in the years after his mother's death on around 40 occasions and dug up nine or ten bodies. But eventually, when this was no longer enough for him, he turned to murder. His first known victim was roadside tavern owner Mary Hogan, who he shot and killed in December 1954, taking her body back to his home for his grotesque handicrafts. Her disappearance went unsolved, and three years later it was Bernice Warden, owner of the local hardware store. He went in to buy some antifreeze and then looked at some guns in a rack. He took one down, loaded it and shot her in the back of the head. He then dragged her into a back room and onto her truck and drove off. After parking up, he then walked back into Plainfield to collect his own car, which he drove back to the truck and transferred the body into his car to take her home to his house of horrors. It wasn't the most sophisticated of crimes. Her family soon noticed she was missing and found blood in the store. The last receipt was made out to Gein and people had seen his car parked out front. When the police arrived at his farm, they found Warden's body headless and strung up by her heels like a carcass in an abattoir. Scattered throughout the house in plain sight was his gruesome collection of human remains. Four noses, nine shrunken heads, Mary Hogan's head in a bag, Bernice Warden's head in a sack, organs in the fridge, skulls on the bedposts, even a pair of lips on the drawstring of a window blind. The nightmarish collection was photographed in its entirety, and if you have a strong enough stomach, you can find some of them on the internet, but I don't think it's right to show them. Gein was taken in for questioning. At first he denied killing Hogan and claimed Warden's death was an accident. But after several days and some encouragement with lie detector tests and roughing up by the sheriff, he admitted both murders. He was also quizzed about earlier unsolved missing persons from the local area. Eight-year-old Georgia Weckler and 15-year-old Evelyn Hartley, and others, but he resolutely denied killing anyone else. A week later he was sent to the Central State Hospital, Wisconsin, where psychiatrists concluded that he had a schizophrenic process which had been going on for at least 12 years, characterized by delusional thinking and hallucinations. He claimed that his crimes were the result of an outside force acting upon him, and that he had been chosen as an instrument of God to carry out activities which were ordained to happen. So that's it. His crimes were caused by his schizophrenic illness, case closed. Well, that's certainly what most people have suggested, but I wanted to look a little more closely at this conclusion. I examined his original psychiatric evaluation from 1957, published in this book, along with a transcript of his confession and some very graphic pictures. The diagnosis given at the time was schizophrenic reaction of the chronic undifferentiated type. That's schizophrenia, right? Well, no, not really. The terminology used in psychiatry is constantly changing and improving. In 1952, the first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders was published by the American Psychiatric Association. The definition of schizophrenia used then is rather vague and would have included many people who would not nowadays be diagnosed with the condition. Plus, US psychiatrists tended to diagnose schizophrenia much more often than in other countries. Let's look at some of Gein's supposedly psychotic symptoms in more detail. Hearing the voice of his mother as he was falling off to sleep, for example. This is not unusual in people who are grieving. And as for concluding that the smelling of decaying flesh was an olfactory hallucination, that might be fair enough in most people's homes, but not in Ed Gein's ghastly charnel house. And his delusions of having a special power to raise the dead? Well, yes, this could be delusional, but when he is talking about it in the police interviews, it comes across more as magical thinking. If only I could bring her back to life, I wonder if I could bring her back to life, than a fixed and unshakable delusional conviction. 
Later, his psychiatrist noted that he was an extremely suggestible individual, and some of the things he said in his confession may well have been responses to leading questions. For these reasons, and the fact that he remained a model patient throughout his long years of hospitalization, always calm and helpful, happy to engage in activities with no behavioral disturbance, despite being on no medication, I think it is unlikely that Ed Gein has schizophrenia. This obviously leads to the question of what was wrong with him then, as he clearly wasn't normal. At the time of his admission, on the basis of his psychology tests, the question of organicity was raised. In other words, the possibility that he might have sustained brain damage at the hands of his father or some other cause. He complained of large gaps in his memory, and this can indicate brain damage, but his doctors were confident that his memory was intact for most subjects and only when emotionally charged situations were encountered, i.e. when talking about his crimes, was there a suggestion of self-serving amnesia or vagueness. There were no abnormalities on his EEG or skull x-ray, and there weren't too many other investigations available at the time, and no treatment, so organicity wasn't pursued further. At the time, US psychiatry was very much dominated by Freudian psychoanalytic thinking, as reflected in the term schizophrenic reaction. Schizophrenia wasn't thought of as a brain disease as it is now, but as a reaction to life experiences and conflicted relationships. This was the era when it was thought that early rejection by your mother could turn you into a schizophrenic. As a neuropsychiatrist, I tend to think of mental symptoms and behavior in terms of brain dysfunction, but that doesn't mean that psychological factors are not important. There can be no doubt that his domineering mother had a disastrous effect on Gein's developing mind, not because it caused him to have schizophrenia, but because she kept him isolated in a joyless, rigid, death and damnation world in which he could never live up to her ideals of absolute perfection. I think it is more likely that he had schizotypal personality disorder. This overlaps to some extent with schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorder, but has the following characteristics. Ideas of reference, odd beliefs or magical thinking that influences behavior, unusual perceptual experiences, odd thinking and speech, suspiciousness, inappropriate or constricted affect, odd eccentric or peculiar behavior or appearance, lack of close friends or confidants, excessive social anxiety. I think this describes Ed Gein rather closely, and being kept away from social contacts and normal human behavior allowed him to travel further and further into his own dark fantasy world. This is what turned a shy, lonely boy into the Plainfield Ghoul. Gein was charged with first-degree murder, but he was found to be unfit to stand trial and committed to hospital as insane. Ten years later, he was taken back to court as he had improved enough to stand trial. He was found guilty of the murder of Bernice Warden, but the court concluded that on the day of the shooting he was not responsible for his actions and he was returned to hospital. In 1974, he filed a petition claiming he had now fully recovered his mental health and there was no reason why he should remain in hospital. The court didn't agree. Four years later, he was moved to Mendota Mental Institute in Madison and in 1984, after a long battle with cancer, he died at the age of 77. Ed Gein's crimes shocked and fascinated America in equal measure. People flocked to his farm to catch a glimpse of something dreadful and even paid money to see his car. He was the inspiration for so many horror film serial killers, even though he wasn't actually one himself, as he was convicted of only one murder and confessed to one more. But that hardly matters. What makes him stand out is what he did with the bodies of the women he killed and those he dug up. This is what is so shocking, even in the 21st century when we think we have heard and seen it all. And it's possible, of course, that he killed many more, his brother, the two local girls, a couple of hunters and their dog. The sexual element also fascinates people. Many of the published accounts of Gein discuss his apparent thoughts of cutting off his penis and becoming a woman, and link this to his creation of a woman suit to enact this. He has even been dubbed the first transgender killer. 
These accounts usually describe him as a necrophiliac, but he always denied trying to have sex with the bodies, as they smelled too bad. And he spoke of these things only during his police interrogation, not when he was in hospital. And it may be that they are nothing more than the false confessions of a highly suggestible man who was simply trying to avoid having his face smashed into the cell wall again. Although so much has been written about Ed Gein, the verifiable sources of information about him are actually very limited, and this can result in conjecture and exaggeration being repeated as fact, like this absurd caption that he was more delusional on a full moon. Ed Gein did terrible things, of that there is no doubt, but his deviance has been put down to a mental illness he may well never have had. People are scared of schizophrenia because of it being linked to criminals like Gein. But in reality, violence is less common in schizophrenia than it is in the general public. And if we are to move forward in our understanding of human behaviour and mental illness, we must challenge some of these long-held but incorrect and stigmatising beliefs about it. Before I end, I should say a big thank you to Karshika Thivakaran for her help in researching this video. And I should also do a disclaimer, although I am a practicing forensic psychiatrist, the cases in these forensic files are not ones I've had any professional dealings with. As a doctor, I have a duty to maintain confidentiality, and all of the information on this channel is already in the public domain. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this one, I'm planning to do several more Forensic Files cases, so please subscribe and click the notifications bell to be kept up to date with all the latest releases. See you next time.